Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 1st, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, you're going to see, I really do mean it. Got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew, which I think is PepsiCo. Need some glasses to read the can. Do not compensate me for this uh, endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, you out there. Give me a shout out. Red Bull said I was too fat. I've got to be an extreme athlete to become a um, Red Bull spokesman. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. I lost my, my short version. I have to put it back in here. The short version says, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that from Greg Morris. All right, hey, do me a favor. This is part of the uh, of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon. Sometimes there's more people here than there are reviews on Amazon. So somebody's holding out on me. So if you read the book, you like the book, and otherwise, I don't know why you'd be here. But do me a favor, put me up a review. As I've said quite a bit, uh, sometimes you can people who are malignant and um, – they put a review up that has nothing to do with the book. They review the other reviewers. I just can't imagine having that much idle time. But anyway, it helps. Even if you disagree with, um, if you agree with um, everyone else. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, let's not spend too much time talking about what we talk about. Uh, but I do want to talk about if the market gets choppy, should you switch to a choppy market system? Uh, I want to continue my discussion on a market of stocks versus a stock market. But we're going to do this uh, when we get to the actual charts. Last week we spent a lot of time on that. And admittedly, things have really improved or have uh, substantially improved, I should say, or somewhat improved over the last week. Um, the question is, Bigfoot, Yeti, and Don. Does Don exist? And that will make a little sense in a few minutes. Um, one thing I've been thinking about lately, um, especially since it's been a little discretion involved and because things don't always work out exactly as you want them is the fact that um, you could be a little sloppy and less than perfect with my methodology. Now the reason I want to talk about that is because there's just two, two reasons, twofold. First, there are some methodologies out there where you've got to get your execution perfect. And if you're trying to follow someone who's following one of these methodologies themselves, it's very difficult for you to repeat their performance because one tiny little mistake could really hurt you. Uh, the good news is with my methodology is you don't have to be that perfect. And the second reason I want to talk about it is because we as humans, we want to be as perfect as possible in what we do. Everyone here is a highly motivated individual. Uh, I know quite a few of you personally. I know some doctors are out there. I know some successful businessmen are out there today. And you're very successful in what you do, and you didn't become successful by being sloppy in what you do, especially you surgeon types out there and any, any of you that cut on people. Um, but in trading, especially with my methodology, you're not going to be exactly right, and you can still be a little sloppy and make money. In fact, I'm going to encourage you not to strive for perfection, and that will make a little bit more sense in a minute. And that's just human nature, and we we have to fight that human nature sometimes when it comes to trading, and, and uh, hopefully I'll flesh that out for you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about discretion. We, I have an example where it worked, and I have an example where it didn't, actually on the same issue. That will make a little more sense in a few minutes, and that can make a big uh, difference. Um, thoughts on your subjects? You can start thinking about uh, – you can start asking questions about trading in general now while I'm on the slides. If you don't mind, hold off on your uh, questions about individual stocks at this moment. When we get to the charts, feel free to ask about them, and I'll remind you 
uh, then. And if you don't mind, if you want to ask about a stock, say you want to know about Ford and IBM and whatever, um, just put one stock on the line, hit return, and then put another stock on the line and hit return. That way I could delete them as we go. And ideally, you want the stocks to be trending and or have some sort of um, uh, trendy characteristics or ideally you want them to also be set up because a lot of times you might say hey is this trending and I'll say yes but there's nothing to do with that stock so ideally the stock should fit the methodology or otherwise I might have to beat you up a little bit okay uh, question is I was talking with a buddy of mine over there in the UK I think uh, I think I, I talked him into joining us today he should be here um, he uh, we were Skyping having a good little chat about uh, about everything, you never know which tangents we go off on. We started talking about um, is it Mopane worms, Mopan, Mopan, Mopane worms. These are worms that um, years ago I used to be more active in my telechart group, and we talk about all kinds of things. And um, anyway, we started talking about Mopane worms yesterday because we see quite a few caterpillars around the property. It reminded me of of uh, him. He doesn't eat them himself, but. Um, some of the people around him were eating quite a few of these Mopane worms. Anyway, um, we did get back to markets eventually, and he said, um, now that the markets are choppy, have you and your own trading moved to a shorter time frame? If you have, do you look for the same setups? Okay. Uh, my quick answer on that is is no and, and no. And, um, you know, now that I'm rereading this, I um, – I'm I, I'm I'm seeing a different um, question than the one I answered. I mean, I I thought um I thought he was asking me if I switched to a choppy market system. Now that I'm reading this out loud, but I guess he's asking me if I'm using my methodology on a shorter term time frame. And um, let me make a note of that. We'll come back to that because I didn't realize what Peter was asking. I just assumed he was asking about reversion to the mean trading, and then. Um, that's really what a lot of this presentation is about. Okay, so let's come back to this uh, shorter time frame. I'll make a note of this. Oops, pen just died. Let me grab another one. And I think he's talking about fractals. So we'll come back to that. But we're going to answer. Let's just pretend this question is. Um, this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Peter, I realize you were asking something different. Uh, let's just say this question is, should you switch? Should you switch to mean reversion trading uh, in choppy markets? In choppy markets, okay? And the answer is no, okay? And I'm, uh, I'm almost finished with Greg's book. It's a pretty good book, Investing with the Trend. I would suggest that you um, you get it. And so I thought Peter was asking a question about mean reversion, so that's the question that I actually prepared slides to answer. So the market gets choppy. It was trending, and now it's getting choppy. Do you switch hats and hop into a mean reversion mode? And my answer is no. And I, Greg put it fairly eloquently in his book, uh, why not use adaptive measures to help identify the two types of markets, meaning a, a trending market and a mean reversion market. And he went on to say, the lag between the two types of markets and the fact that often there is no clear period of delineation is the issue. And I like how he went on to say, it is a natural instinct to want to change a strategy in order to respond more quickly from one to the other. Okay, and that that sort of dovetails in with my little speech that I started off when I started working on the slides about you don't have to be perfect uh, perfect in all this. Okay, but I think your natural instinct tells you, well, the markets are choppy, so I should be trading the choppy market system, and I should abandon trend following until the market trends again. And I think that's easy easier said than done. Uh, natural instincts are what we are trying to avoid simply because we are gen they are generally wrong and painfully wrong at the worst time. Sharpshooting the process is the beginning of the end. 
Now, I know what Greg means by that. What Greg's saying is you're looking at, first of all, hindsight's twenty twenty. He also talked a lot about that. When you look at a market in hindsight, it might look like this, okay? And you're going to say, well, why not just trade reversion to the mean here? Why not trade trend here, reversion to the mean here, and trend here, okay? Well, the problem is there's long lead and lag cycles that can occur, or I should say there's a lot of lag, and he talks about that too. Um, so let's say you identify, oh, wait a minute, we're in a reverse into the bead mark, and you identify that here or somewhere in here. By the time you begin trading it, guess what happens? The market begins to trend. So then you say, well, wait a minute, I better change hats. Oh, I just lost a lot of money because the market's trending. I better change hats to a trending uh, methodology. And you, you're right here, and then what happens? You go to reverse to the mean period. Like I say quite often, I call it African Queen Syndrome. A lot of people, uh, the markets will be doing this, and a lot of people will give up right about here. And then what happens? They'll give up on trend following. The market has the mother of all trends. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but the reason my, methodologies, my web methodology works and the reason a lot of other methodologies work too, it's the same reason, is because sometimes it don't, okay? Sometimes it doesn't work. So you have enough people that give up right around here and quit, and then the market starts to trend again, okay? Now, let's talk about reversion to the mean trading versus trend trading. Now, in an ideal world, reversion to the mean trading would look like a sine wave. You would, you would buy it when it's oversold, and you would sell it when it's overbought. And by the way, speaking of uh, <laughs> Greg, one thing he points out, he says, you ever notice like somebody will have a, a chart and then they'll have an indicator down here. And it's like their buy signals, their actual signal will be here, but their buy signal will be like back there. It's like there's a little bit of a, <laughs> they're off by a month or two in the signals. And it's just, uh, I'm sure it's just an oversight, but it is kind of funny uh, how many presentations will actually have that in there. You won't see that from me, though. Anyway, in an ideal world, uh, reverse to be looks like a sine wave, and it just goes about its merry way. You buy the bottom, sell the top, buy the bottom, sell the top, rinse and repeat, and you make a lot of money. The reality is it will often stop long before it gets to that oversold, and then it will go straight back up. And then say it's super overbought here, and you go to sell it. Well, then it just keeps becoming more and more and more overbought. You end up with like maybe one of those trending markets. The true reversion to the bean people say, don't use stops. Well, what if this trend goes on for a couple of years? Well, you're obviously going to blow up, okay? So, unfortunately, it's a lot messier than you would think or what you would want to believe when it comes to reversion to the mean type of trading. It probably looks a lot more like the red line I've drawn here than it does to this um, sine wave that I have in. So, I'm for the most part, I think the reversion to the mean uh, it's not a sine wave situation. It's you end up waving to your money as it goes bye bye. Okay. Now, any questions on reversion to the mean? Now, keep in mind that I do have, as a, a friend of mine pointed out once, um, I do have a reversion to the mean characteristic. So I'm looking for that trend and I'm looking for that pullback in that market to get somewhat oversold before I look to get in. So I am trying to play the reverse to the mean back, but the, but I'm also playing it in the direction of the trend. So I'm not fighting the trend, okay? And I'm, hopefully I'm getting that pop out, which gives me that short-term profit, okay? And then allows me to stick with that if that turns into a longer-term trend. So I'm trying to capture this part of the reversion to the mean as opposed to flat-out reversion to the mean trade. Okay. Any questions on reverses that mean or anything else? Related question, are there any case for adjusting your profit taking and stops in a choppy market? Um, not so much adjusting of the stops, uh, except that you might be willing to let a stock get nicked if you're in a choppy market. In other words, like the, like the mother of all um, discretion examples we used, 
or I've been using forever is that uh, the, the SPWR triggered at 550, had a pretty good run, came back to nine, exactly nine. That's where the stop was. Uh, traded one or two trades at nine, never traded. I don't think it even bid below nine. And then took off, and now it's uh, it's in the mid 30s. So, yes, if it's a choppy market, you might get a little bit more lenient when it comes to discretion around your stops. And I'm going to show you some discretionary techniques in just one second. And you might also say, okay, well, this market's really choppy, and I'm within spitting distance of my profit target. So, you know what? I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm going to go ahead and take that profit, and I'll talk about that in one second. Hello, Dave. Trends seem to be represented by the inefficiency of price. Yes. Um, if you have uh, my stock, if, if you've viewed the stock selection webinar, and I think I might have talked about that a little bit in the, um, in the free, free one that's on my website, too. And what you're doing is, uh, and the free one's right here under free videos, I have an introduction to stock selection. And I think I talked about inefficiency there. And inefficiency means that everything isn't priced in. And one thing that I've written about is um, we have a, um, you have a stock, a little solar stock that goes up 600% or a little biotech stock or even a burrito maker or something that goes up three or four hundred percent. So all that wasn't priced in. Now efficient market hypothesis says that everything is priced into the market. And to some extent it's true, but that is really when it refers, refers to efficient stock. So if you've got a big thick cap stock where the, the earnings are known, the projections of the earnings are known, they're in a stable business, they don't have that much competition, or the competition is known, blah, 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 then that stock's going to tend to chop around and be a little bit more efficient, okay? But if you've got some kind of developing technology where the promise of the future, notice I say promise, not necessarily reality, but the promise of the future is there, then that stock might run up two, three hundred, four hundred percent, maybe five hundred percent or more on that excitement. And that's that's how we make our years and that's where the real money is. And everything in between is just kind of chipping away uh, at it and hopefully uh, capturing not only that short term move but a longer term move in addition. Okay? How do you determine your additional purchase price if you think you have a good Phoenix stock? Well, the Phoenix stock, as we've um, discussed before in here, and eventually I'm, I'm actually I'm working on a chapter on that. I said I'd never write another book. It's too much work. And then, of course, I started writing another book. <laughs> I'm writing a book on um, on uh, stock selection, but it's gonna be I think it's going to be a little bit more than that. Um, a Phoenix stock is a stock that falls from grace. And uh, my buddy Dick Fruth over in Houston, Texas, he calls them tombstones, and he's got a little bit different pattern than me. Uh, but we've both kind of come to the same conclusion that these stocks that base for a long, long time at low levels, especially stocks that have fallen from grace, have the potential to rise from the ashes. So I call them Phoenix stocks. Um, I think Dick's a little bit more inclined. Uh, I haven't. He hasn't uh, finished his book yet. But I think Dick's a little bit more inclined to buy these stocks and sit on them. Um, he's a little bit more old school when it comes to that. But uh, one thing that he did like, he liked the way my bow tie pattern kind of dove in, dovetailed in with his pattern. And uh, so if you wait for like a bow tie or something or a first thrust or like a little cup and handle or something, something transitional that suggests that trend has turned and then look to get on, that's what a Phoenix stock is. And then the solar stocks, in late 2012 did this and they became some of the biggest winners um, last year. Now the question is how do you determine your additional purchase price? Well if you buy it here, let's say you flip out some shares here and you go into longer term trend following mode, if the stock pulls back again and sets up as a generic setup, then by all means you take that setup and then hopefully that trend continues 
and then you might flip out some of those shares just to get that swing trade profit back off. I call that trading around a core position. It doesn't set up often, but every now and then you will get a stock with this sawtooth pattern where you can rinse and repeat. We've talked about this quite a bit in webinars before, so I don't want to spend too much time on it today because we've got a lot of other stuff to cover. But the main, per, the main thing is if it's a setup that you would take in and of itself and you're already long the stock, then by all means put some shares on and flip them out for a swing trade and hopefully you can rinse and repeat. In my trading service, I don't say directly to put shares on after uh, you have something that sets up again that's we have a core position in. But I will point out to my clients, hey, this is set up, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You might want to look at an add-on type of trade. But to keep things simple, I only show the original trades, okay? Did, did, I, did, did, I, did that answer your question? Sounds like a plan for shorting as well, basically on the top, waiting for the fruit to drop. Okay, I'm not sure what you're asking. For your IPO pattern, when does an IPO stop being an IPO? That's a good question, Jerry, and that's one thing that I am studying and these IPOs, and we, we took a position in Pandora a while back, and it was public for a year or so. Uh, I, I think there's something that's, rel that's still good in a relatively new issue. So even after a year or so, there's some um, promise in an IPO. But I think in IPOs, the euphoria is usually within the first 50 days or so. But I will look at stocks it did, after 50 days. They go into my, my general database, so I'm going to see them anyway. Um, but I would say it probably as a, as a general statement, ideally within the first 50 days, but then after 100 days, I think they're still valid. Now, there's some newer breakout patterns that I haven't published just yet. I did talk about them in the stock selection webinar, not to tease you, but I, I haven't made them fully public yet. Um, and I can't imagine that you'd have an IPO that would go 100 days or so without triggering. So that would probably be um, a good number. But I will tell you this. I've seen some that actually they set up within the first week. They, they make the pattern, and then they might trigger a month or two later. And in those situations, I think it's still viable because what happens is a lot of the supply works its way through the system. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to get in the charts just yet, but let me just show you Twitter real quick, and that's, that, that's the one that comes to mind. And um, it's obviously not doing that well now, but if we back the chart way out, okay, oh, well, maybe it wasn't that long. Yeah, it wasn't. It was only. It was only about a month. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Okay, we had our set. Yeah. So you had a trigger here. Okay, I thought it was a little bit longer than that. I might be thinking of another one, but it's still a pretty good example because you had your first week of trading. Okay, and then let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Yeah, I mean it's it's closing in on three on a, on a month. So you had almost a month's worth of trading before we actually had that trigger uh, based on that uh, breakout strategy, okay? Um, I hope I answered your question. I guess it depends how long is an IPO still an IPO. Uh, 100 days or less is a general rule, ideally 50 days or less, okay? And then, but longer term or, or slightly older IPOs uh, are still possible, okay? Okay, good. Sounds like a plan for shorting as well, basing on the top, waiting for the fruit to drop. You're talking about the Phoenix strategy. Well, the, the, the Phoenix strategy at some point in time was probably a beautiful setup to the downside. Uh, as I often preach, if you're going to trade a trend transitional pattern, and there's three types of trading that I do. I do trend resumption, which is your generic pullback looks like that. I do trend acceleration, which is you look for an acceleration of trend, and then you look for a pullback. And then I did trend transition, where you look for a market that's, in, that's going in one direction to begin to roll over and hopefully continue after the first correction in that new direction. So, yeah, as a fall from grace, 
and let's say a stock makes an all-time high, begins to sell off, pulls back, sets up nicely. GME did that recently, although it didn't turn into the mother of all trades. But GME is an example, a recent example from the service that comes to mind that did that. GME, let's see what's going on there. Yeah, you can see that. I've got it all marked up in here. And it, it made a bow tie down. Oops. It made a bow tie down after all-time highs. It made a first thrust down after all-time highs. And it also was a reversal gap strategy. We didn't get rich off of that trade. But as you can see, uh, it did have a retrace, but then it made a nice move lower. It had a nice little overnight gap there, which worked out nicely. And I think it gapped through the initial profit target, which is always a, a, a treat. Okay. Okay. Uh, a round trip, a round trip in efficiency to the max. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got you got a, a market. I mean, let's say that GameStop uh, continues to fall from grace. It comes down here to ten bucks a share, or five bucks a share, whatever it may be, and goes sideways for about three years. Well, um, if a company could stay in business, excuse me. If a company could stay in business during that trending period, then some of those bad memories from people who are holding a stock, the stock works its way through the system. Uh, the company may reinvent itself. All these things I wrote about when I talked about the uh, the Phoenix strategy. I haven't published it yet, but we've been talking about it for quite a while. So all that excess supply works its way through the system. The company may reinvent itself. Uh, competition may go away. And then, or it could be the case, you know, one of my favorite examples is that the technology of the future is no longer the technology of the future. Because so you look at something like SPWR, okay, which fell from grace forever. Back when it fell from grace, let's maybe take a look at a, a weekly chart. So back here in 2007, it's like, ooh, solar stocks, that's going to be the, the, the energy of the future. Well, guess what? The future has not come yet. So what happened, and I'm not sure why I'm talking like Captain Kirk, but what happened was the uh, technology was not viable for, let's see, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so for five years, it's like, wait a minute, this this company is is FOS. They have no technology. They or they the technology doesn't work that great. Uh, there is no reality in this company. And then five years later, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, maybe there is. And the stock bottoms out and then takes off nicely after making a very 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 nice base in here. Okay. So when a stock gaps through the initial target, what's the strategy at that point? Take profits immediately or reset target and let it run more? Um, well, you're always going to take profits that same day when it gaps through. What I recommend, and then this SPWR is a perfect example in this particular day, uh, it gapped through the profit target by a, sub a substantial amount. You still want to exit that same day, but here's where a little discretion could help you squeeze a little bit more blood out of the trade or out of the turnip, however you want to look at it. Okay, let's see if we can get to that point, okay? So on this particular day, I think the initial profit target was about right here, okay? I think 650 if memory serves, okay? So it gapped above that, and it had a tiny bit of a dip. But what you could say is, look, I've got my initial profit target and some. So even if it comes all the way down to 650, I'm still doing well, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait to see what's going to happen during the day. And I can either trail a stop higher. That's one thing I said. I could say you can play that's enough. If this stock goes up a couple of more points, I mean, $2, you know, say it goes up $2 more on a $6 stock, that's a 33% move in one way. In one day, you could say that's enough. Or you could just exit on the close, okay? In this particular case, you would have squeezed out a pretty nice profit. Um, I like to try to exit on the close as much as possible and not try to watch it too much intraday and, and micromanage it. 
uh, to each its own, but you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits when it gaps through. But you got to realize you're in such a good position, you could sit back and let it unfold. But, yes, by the end of the day, you do want to make sure you've locked in that half of the windfall because chances are pretty good it will retrace that. In fact, notice that it retraced almost 100% of that, uh, which would have been a windfall on that uh, on that first loaf before taking off again. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the Twitter round trip, and that's that, that's you know maybe that's inefficiency at its best. I, I guess that you were talking. Is, is that what you were talking about? The fact that the Twitter made uh, a round trip. I'm sounding like old people. The Twitter. <laughs> Let's look at the Twitter. Yeah, I mean, that's inefficient, okay? $40 stock goes to $80 and then goes back to $40. Okay? That's inefficiency at its finest. And you had, you really didn't have a clean signal in here. Maybe a first thrust, and it probably was a forced bow tie. No, nope, not so much. Um but yeah, it went straight up and then went straight down. That's inefficiency at its finest. Okay. You're welcome, Greg. Dave, what's an email for a question? Uh Dave at DaveLandry.com. And um I'll show my business card here in a few minutes if you ever need to get in touch with me. But the email is just plain old Dave. I need to put a catch all email. I used to have a catch all email, but you get so much junk in those. I don't even know how to set it up now. D A V E at DaveLander.com. I answer all my emails within reason, okay? Um, <laughs> I've answered emails for like three years and then I'm like, this guy must be mentally challenged because everything I am telling him is in the book. And finally I'm like, um, are you mental? Have you? Could you just do me a favor and reread the book? Oh, I've been meaning to get the book. It's like, well, <laughs> read the book first, or at least come to a few of these webinars and get an idea of what's going on. Um, but I don't mind. Within reasons, like at some point, you will have to get educated, and the material is out there. And I'm doing these. I do these things every week. So make sure you uh, just get a little educated. I hope they didn't come out wrong. Got a question here from Mr. Phil. Phil says, I am curious, is Don on the service? No. If not, was he ever? Uh, I don't think so. Is he even real or a fake protagonist for the show? Well, Phil, I can assure you that Don is real. In fact, he's here today. Um, and um, Don, can you give me a picture of yourself? Could you Skype that over to me? Okay. I came in quick. Here we go. Here's a picture of Don. <laughs> a little inside humor for uh, fans of the show. This came from Superstock.com. I'm not sure if that's really Don. It could be. Are you using a hard stop? It sounds like soft. Can you take a little? Uh, can you take a little to that? Yeah, uh, talk a little to that. My eyes are. I'm losing it. Um, if you're going to exercise a little discretion in your trades, like we're going to talk about here, in just one second, um, you will have to use a. Uh, as you call it, a soft stop or a, a mental stop. Um, say you can't watch a screen and your normal stop would be here. You might put in what I call an airbag, and, and I'm not the first person. I think I got that term from a book called Trading Chaos, and you know me. I'm not a big fan of chaos in the markets. I look for order, but I think that gentleman was the first guy to use the term um, airbag. So I like it. it kind of stuck with me. Um, so I'll give him credit for that. You can put it in an airbag stop and go about your life. And then you're going to get hurt and you're going to live to to fight another day. 
you know, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Um, but it might allow you to apply some discretion. Let's say this is where I suggest a good stop would be, and the market comes down and kind of trades through that stop, and then turns around and goes right back up. If you had an airbag in place, you might survive one or two of those moves, and that might be enough to make you year and to make it worthwhile. Now, if you get stopped on a lot of airbags, obviously, it's gonna it's gonna kind of suck. Okay, um, what I'm gonna show here in one minute is sometimes you could use a little discretion, like your initial profit target might be right here, the market's about right here, and it's really really close. But let's say the overall market's oversold or over overall market is choppy and not just going in one solid direction, then it's okay to take profits a little early. In fact, we'll get into that um, in just one second. But as far as stops, let's say you have a market that comes down, like we just talked about, that nick on um, SPWR, and just kind of nicks the stop, stops at 9, it trades at 9, one or two trades at 9, and then it begins to take off again. Then, by all means, stay with that position, and that's where uh, you don't have to be perfect in these trades. So you could be a little sloppy, and this kind of like dovetails into um, our next uh, topic. So the pressure's off. You don't have to be 100% correct, at least in my methodology. You're not either right or wrong. There are some shades of gray in between. Now, let's talk about being a little sloppy. I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. I'm just saying uh, a little sloppy. I probably should say being a little less than perfect. I guess a little sloppy has a negative connotation, but that's probably the best way of phrasing it, though. Uh, keep in mind that you might not get that uh, exact profit target, okay? You're at a stock, you're looking for $10, okay? You're in at 8, okay? And it might go to 9.99 or 9.95. It just kind of just does this. It never does make it to 10. So in a case like that, it's okay to take that near miss. In fact, I would actually say it's advisable that you do that, especially if you factor in the current conditions, okay? Now, Taking a somewhat near miss after a near miss is okay, too. Oh, okay. Now, let's say, and I'm going to show you an exact example of this in one second. But let's say a market rallies up and gets pretty close to that profit target, within pennies, literally, okay? And you are off saving lives and building buildings or repairing automatic transmissions or doing whatever you do, and you forgot or you didn't even realize you were that close to the profit target. Okay. By the way, one thing you could do is maybe have, you know, obviously if you're coming into today and the stock is right here, you know you're pretty close to that profit target. It might need to be watched. But let's say the market is down here. What you might do is you might put in an alert that will go to your smartphone to let you know that that stock is getting close to the initial profit target, and you might have to apply a little bit of discretion. Now, when I say get a little sloppy or be a little less than perfect, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. Don't take a hundred dollar profit if you're looking for a thousand dollar profit on the first loaf, but it might be okay given the situation to take a nine hundred dollar profit, okay, depending on again the situation at hand. Uh, you're not going to get rich with the short term profits, but it does help to keep you in the game. Sometimes you can actually, over a series of trades, profit from it, and that will mitigate the few losses incurred. And it will also, as I sort of implied here, keep the lights on. Now, let's talk about being a little sloppy on the long side. I'm sorry, on the longer term side. So let's say once you have a tiger by the tail, meaning that once you've got a stock that has done two things. One, it has had, it has have, it has had, it has had a material positive change in price. You get in that stock at five and now it's at 10 or 15 or even 20, okay? So two things have happened for that to occur. One, you caught a material change in price, 
and two, uh, on top of that material change in price, you also have an expansion in volatility. And that's one reason we let stops widen out a little bit. If we do what we do properly, we not only capture that change in price, but we capture an accelerated change in price, which also means that volatility has likely increased and expanded. That's one reason that we don't trade stocks that are crazy volatile because if there's a chance that that volatility has already exploded. Okay, We ideally want to get in a stock and then have volatility explode while we're in it. And that's a, a beautiful thing in the direction of the trend, of course. Now, when that does happen, you've got that tiger by the tail. You want to give it a little bit of room so it can correct if it has to. And then hopefully uh, take off again. Um, keep in mind that you will never catch the exact high if you're long a stock and I recommend you don't try to do so just use that trailing stop and you have to be willing to give up some of those open profits and you got to be really careful of uh, anchoring of prices I actually sometimes uh, like to almost forget about where I got in a stock on a big winner because in doing so I, I tend to not focus on the the gains until after I'm stopped out. And if you're focusing on the gains too much and you're watching every tick, and I know I publish a spreadsheet every day and I show the, the gains and the losses, uh, warts and all, every day. But in some cases, you might not want to watch it that close because you'll end up with a, an anchoring. Uh, an anchoring mean, meaning that, and this is uh, something I'm kind of borrowing from Greg Morris also, but an anchoring is a price, like how much would you pay for this? $10, $15? You, you get these prices anchored in your mind, and then let's say you've, you've gotten that little $10 stock and it runs up to 20 bucks. Well, you, and you used to see it at 20 bucks. Well, you've got that anchored in your mind, and you've got your initial price anchored in your mind, and psychologically it's going to be hard to give up those gains because you've already kind of got have those prices anchored in your mind whereas and the reason I'm telling you this is I got a little not too bad but I let it, I let a stock get away from me a little bit but I knew it was a big winner and I was giving it some room so finally I said look I've got to follow my rules I got to get out of this thing so I got out it's a by surprise I still made 66 percent on the trade obviously that doesn't always happen but that's one of the things one of the things that has me thinking about this the the you could be a little sloppy you can give them a little extra room and if you get stopped out so what look at things on a net net basis but had I had that price anchored in my mind when it was up a hundred percent I might have been focusing on the fact that I'm up 100% and gave up a substantial amount of money, whereas now I'm thinking, you know what, I had a good trade, I'm going to pat myself on the back, and then I'm going to say next. And oh, by the way, and I'm as guilty as anyone, that same day I exited, I got out at almost the exact low on that day. By the end of the day, the stock, which had been dropping intraday, turned around and closed in the plus column, okay? So what do I do? Well, I'm going to take it off of my screen because it's not set up anymore. And I'm not going to watch it every day in anguish. I'm just going to let it go, okay, like like the Frozen song, let it go. And then look for my next opportunity. So don't worry about the dead money. And you need to be patient, too, okay? So let's say you do get into a position and it rallies up, but then it begins to go sideways. Well, the old me would have gotten bored and exited and called it dead money. But the newbie, or the newer bee over the last six years, ten years maybe, will just stick with it. And sometimes moves take time to unfold. And sometimes you will get that two- or three-month base, and then it takes off again. So here's where you want to become like Ron Papil with his Showtime 2000 rotisserie grill. You want to set it and forget it. And not worry about these positions so much. You've got to stop in place maybe down here below this base, okay? And you want to forget about that stock. That's your good stock, okay? That's your good winning stock. Don't obsess over it every day. Don't monetize how much you could buy if you exited right here. If you already took partial profits in this position, then you're good to go. Just let things unfold. And that's where the real money is in that longer-term trade. 
Forget about that so-called dead money. If you knew that the stock would go sideways and then eventually roll over, then by all means, take your profits while it's going sideways. The problem is you don't know that, and I think you bet you're better off air, uh, to err in the direction of the trend. So if you've got a pretty good trend behind the stock, just let your stop take you out. So what if you don't get this exact high? If you got it here, look at things that are debt, debt basis, okay? And if you were successful, pat yourself on the back and move on. I uh, years ago, I got uh, I was off by like three quarter. I made like forty points on an options trade, which was ridiculous. And um, I kind of got a shitty feel on, and it was off by three quarters of a point. And I was working with a another trader at the time and he laughed at me because I made 40 points or whatever and I was pissed off because I didn't make 40 and three quarter points he's like so what he's like, how many times are you gonna make that in your career and he had a good point so you're never gonna catch that exact high um, and if you even if you got sloppy I probably put it a, 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 an order I shouldn't have on a thin option and I got spanked because of it. And, and I actually complained to the broker, and they kind of laughed at me too. Um, but you can be a little sloppy if you're just executing within the realm of the general rules and within the system, and you don't have to be perfect, and you're not going to be perfect, and you're not going to catch an exact high. Now, let's talk a little bit about exercising discretion. And again, even within this exercising discretion, it kind of dovetails in with the whole theme of today's show, and that you don't have to be perfect at it. Now, I don't know if you can see this on your chart, but I think the low is 36.73. We had a profit target of 36.70. Okay, let me do the math on that. Carry this. Okay, three cents. That's three cents away. We were three cents away from the profit target. So the profit target. If I tried to draw that on the chart, it would look like that. That's a profit target, but it didn't quite actually hit it. Okay. Now, somewhere around here, as this thing was dropping, I put out a tweet, or a tweet, I sound like the old people again, on the Twitter, uh, saying that, hey, smoke a watch on this stock. Remember, this is a short, triggered about right here. Uh, didn't do a whole lot for a while, but then began to implode nicely, and I thought I was going to have the mother of all winners on my hand. So it came down here. It came within three cents of the stop. Let's look at that intraday. So this is a five-minute chart. You can see it was a nice little move throughout the day lower. You can see why I would put a um, – I'd mention it on Twitter, right, because it's just kind of a nice move lower. And your profit target was right there, three cents below whatever that price is. Didn't quite hit it, okay? And then it begins to be in there around a little bit. Now, I'm not saying watch every tick, but I'm saying you can set a smartphone – to let you know when you're getting fairly close to that profit target so you can decide whether or not to take action, especially when the market is kind of choppy like it is. So don't split hairs. And even if you didn't get this exact low here, you had 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Uh, you had 30 or 40 minutes where you could have gotten out. It's still done fairly well. You could have even gotten out over the next maybe hour or two and done fairly well. Now let's look at the next day. Even on the next day, the stock traded lower, at least from the close. Let me just draw that in again. Here's your close here, and then look how low the stock traded, and then the initial profit target was right there. So even this is a second chance. Okay? Don't look a gift horse in the mouth, especially given that second chance. Even in that second chance, you could have done fairly well by taking a little discretion and getting out a little early. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, and on this particular day here, you're up a half a point or a quarter of a point, whatever the case may be, and you exit half of your stock. Okay? You don't want to have a four-point stop or whatever the case is and take like a, a quarter-point profit or even a one-point profit because that's, that's a quick way to get into a lot of trouble fast. It's the old commodity adage, eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant. Okay. But if you're pretty close, if you're within spinning distance of the profit target, even though you're looking for, let's say, $1,000 on a 100K account on half of that position, even if you're just a little shy of that, especially given the market conditions, it's okay to take those profits a little early. Now let's look what happened the following day. This thing just took off. 
Okay. So if that did happen, you not only missed th this winning trade here, now you're being punished with a pretty bad uh, losing trade. Now, if it comes up here and it hits a stop intraday, it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. Dave says, says with a gap open, just to sit back and see what happens. And if they immediately turn around and drop, then stay with the trade. But in this particular case, it kept going higher. So if this is the gap and this is your stop and it keeps going higher, at some point you have to have an uncle point saying, no, that's enough. If it goes any further, I'm out, and you get out of the trade. So even if you give it a little bit of rum, you certainly could mitigate your, the any additional damage in the trade. Okay. Now, what a, the best, the great thing is, on occasions, this will roll, roll right back over, and those can make some really good trades. And if you can stay with one or two big winners through a little bit of discretion, you can make your whole uh, year. Okay. Now, let me show you what that looks like. Okay. So this is what how the trade ended up overall, based on following things mechanically. Stopped out at forty-three fifty. Um, the maximum loss, boring overnight gaps, was going to be $1,000 on both sides of the trade, $2,000 total, and the trade lost $1,000, okay? So you only lost about half of what you were willing to lose, but, you know, it still stinks, don't get me wrong. But if you applied a little discretion, you would have made a little money on the first loaf, even if you would have gotten a little liberal in it, okay, where you exited, I'm sorry, even if you got a little liberal where you exited, you would have made a little money in the first loaf, that's pretty good, okay, and then if you'd have stopped out at a reasonable level, you would have lost a little bit, but overall, that would have been a profitable trade with a little discretion. Now, here's where it makes a difference, even on a short-term trade. On a longer term trade, let's say this thing uh, turned around and went right back down and it became the mother of all winners and it went it went down to, I don't know, low single digits and you had this huge move on your hands, then that's obvious. But what's not so obvious is how important this could be shorter term too. If with a little discretion you make a profit here, and hopefully I'm not rubbing salt in anybody's wounds because I know quite a few of you did take pro profits uh, early, so kudos to you. Uh, to those who did, hey, this is a learning experience. Maybe it needs to be a little bit painful. And, and before you start, write me a letter or quitting the service. Look, if it doesn't cause a little bit of pain, if it's not a painful lesson, you're not going to remember it. it. This is not going to mean anything when it happens again. But if you're a little frustrated now, that's a good thing. So you'll learn how this discretion works, okay? And then next time, it'll work out uh, just fine for you. Right now, you're probably mad at me. But down the road, you'll thank me, I promise you. But what's interesting, again, and this is the importance, even in the short term, is if you take the swing from minus 925 to 839, that's a $1,763 swing in the portfolio, okay? So you could see the difference between taking that loss and taking that gain. It's not that you just took a little loss, and that trust me, that's going to happen more often than I wish it would, but it will happen. But more importantly, you missed out on a possible gain. And on a net-net basis, that's a that's a pretty big number there when you take that swing from that uh, negative to a positive uh, trade. Uh, I'm ready to jump into the charts. Any questions on um, trading in general? Any questions on anything I said so far? And, and if not, we'll, we'll go ahead and get into the um, – charts. Hey, Dave, if Twitter's inefficient, then what lies ahead? I don't know, Rick. Um, and we'll hop, I'll go ahead and hop into the overall markets. Uh, let me get into the markets now, and then we'll get into individual stocks. You can start asking about stocks now if you want. Uh, I don't know what lies ahead, but if I was smart and I knew what I was doing, I would get out my business card, which is somewhere in here. In fact, uh, let me let me wrap up the slides. I forgot to do that. I want to come up. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, here we go. So on the Twitter, if I was smart, 
I would uh, take out my business card, and I would look on the back of it, and I would say, it looks like this. It looks like a downturn, okay? So that's what lies ahead of a Twitter. It's headed lower. Now, it's not set up at the moment. Uh, by the way, just uh, one more time, as I've been saying this every week, pressure's off. Don't don't worry about being a bull, being a bear. I know I've been a little bearish lately, but I'm trying to keep an open mind to everything, and then we're going to get into the market analysis here in five minutes, or a few minutes, I should say. And um, you'll see where I am looking for the good and the bad, but you got to be careful not to label yourself. And then, of course, the easiest thing to do is make sure you plan your trade and trade your plan and have some kind of idea what you're doing. Uh, somebody pointed out today that there is a misprint uh, towards the bottom of this. Uh, there's a misprint on the bottom of this um, um, thing on my website. That's actually an important call. It's a fund manager. I want to talk to him. <laughs> but uh, you know what? You guys are here. I'm not going to interrupt it for you guys. Uh, towards the bottom, I say six months, but it is now one year of the service. So if you get the stock selection webinar, uh, I'll give you a year of my trading service, which is actually more expensive than the webinar itself. So uh, I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, and what's cool about it is, from an egotistical standpoint, it's cool because you get to see how I – pick stocks from an educational standpoint and then you get to watch me actually pick them for a year and see how it uh, how it all plays out so it's kind of a cool thing but anyway see my website for more on that and watch the original um, watch the intro video at the least and that's free uh, the intro video that is I have uh, volumes uh, one and two uh, or I should say I have all the year and I've reduced the price on these so I've got 2012 and then I've got um, 2013. There it is, 2013. Uh, if these are like 60 something hours of these uh, weekly presentations, so if you get something out of these presentations, you'll get a lot of the archives of these. They're on flash drives and they're pretty reasonable. Uh, so check those out if you get a chance. They're on my website. First two books are still relevant to the process. In fact, I talk a lot about patterns out of the first two books here, so make sure you have all three books, and especially layman's, okay? Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, all right, let's 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 uh, let's hop into the charts. I, I, sorry to pimp the stuff, but that's how we that's how we pay for all this. I was, uh, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars for GoToWebinar. It's a couple thousand dollars for website, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there. We can add up after a while. I do enjoy doing this, though, so I'm not complaining. I'm just saying. Um, but I'm not completely altruistic either. Uh, let's take a look at the overall market. And um, as I've been saying quite a bit, what's concerning is I think the P's are masking what's going on internally. Uh, they have to, although I have to say things have improved a little bit over the last week, and that's why you want to take things one day at a time. We're just shy of these all-time highs in the P's. In fact, let me see if it'll let me measure it with today's data in there. Uh, yeah, you're about a third of a percent away from all-time highs, as you can see. So that's definitely a good thing. The only thing that bothers me about the P's, well, there's two things. On the surface, Net, net, you really hadn't changed much in a couple of months, okay? So this says, oh, well, Dave, it looks like a reversion to the mean market. And you know what? You'd be right, okay? Uh, it is. But that doesn't mean you should rush out and try to trade. By the way, one thing I was going to talk about earlier I didn't think about at the time is um, I've – I've been in the company of traders who claim that they could switch from trend following mode to reverge to the mean mode to back to trend following mode. And I find their claims uh, highly dubious. I don't think anybody is that good. And I guess instead of picking on them, maybe I should say I certainly am not that good. I am certainly, if, if, if there is such a way, uh, which I think, by the way, would be the holy grail. But you know these traders, they're always right, no matter what. It's like, oh, well, I'm just reverting to the mean trading because it's choppy. It's like, yeah, right. 
So don't put that pressure on you. Again, the pressure's off. The second thing that concerns me about the peas, other than their sideways action, is the fact that they they have been supported mostly by defensive uh, issues. And there's a variety of ways you could you could you could check that out. But one thing you could do, um, and I'm just kind of doing it on the fly here, would be to uh, sort by um, your relative strength. And then let's change back to the component. And you could probably, hopefully, hopefully this will work because um, I'm doing it on the fly. And then let's take a look. Notice that you have uh, a drug, which you could argue could be um, defensive in nature. You got utilities. There's an energy. There's a drug. Energy, energy. So you've got a lot of these defensive stocks in here, drug, energy, um, and then some commodity-related commodity areas. But these commodities, notice BTU, that's an energy. CNX, that's an energy. Another energy. So you get the idea. So it's mostly these energy stocks and a few other mostly defensive-related stocks that are propping up the entire market. So that has, I've been really concerned about that and I've been talking about that at nauseam. Now what's concerning is when, not if, these areas begin to correct. So take a, let's take a look at energies real quick and we'll see in energies if I could find them. There they are. What you see within energies is that they've pretty much gone straight up. I've got the, the green arrow pointing upward here. So when, not if they correct, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the overall market. Now, while we're talking about defensive-related issues, let's just take a look at uh, tobacco. Okay, it's kind of going straight up in here today, notwithstanding. And utilities in other ones areas. Selected consumer non-durable, such as personal products. Um, well, today, notwithstanding, but it has been headed higher. Um, you continue to use personal products in a bear market, obviously, and then at least I hope you would, okay? So for the most part, even though the P's look pretty good, you've got a, a very narrow range of stocks that are holding up the entire market if you're using the P's as a benchmark. Now, again, things have improved over the last week, and right now, if you look at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ's up significantly, okay? So things are changing a little bit in here. Um, you can see now... It looks like it's going to come back and try to challenge this recent little peak in here. But coming into today, we'll take out today's action, you could see that it looked like thrust pull back, thrust down. And even um, I wouldn't rush out and buy this market just yet because from where I stand, and I am standing today, I'm working off a stand-up desk, uh, from where I stand, it sure looks like this little downtrend remains intact. But, yeah. This was another good day in here. But one thing you need to realize is that we are, at the least, becoming really choppy in here. And what do you do in choppy markets if you're a trend follower? Well, you switch over to be reversion trading. No, no, you don't do that. What you do is you end up sitting on your hands and you wait for the next trend to emerge, where, wherever that may be. Okay. Um, now, let's take a look at the Russell 2000. The Russell is kind of like the um, the S and P. I'm sorry, kind of like the Nasdaq. And so far, it sure looks like it's still in another leg down. One thing I like to do is I like to dissect as many bars as I can. Uh, even though you got today's little action higher, if you take the chart out, the way I've drawn these trend lines, so far it looks like thrust pullback and then thrust down. So. I think the Russell's still in trouble, and if you just, um, I'm not a huge fan of connecting the dots over the highs and the lows for your trend lines, but if you did want to do that and use that as your metric, then you'd say, well, wait a minute, I, I could see based on that, it sure looks like they're still in a downtrend. One day at a time, though, and again, things have improved over the last couple of days. What I'm seeing at the least is you got certain areas, let's say like Internet, where, let me clean this chart up for you. It's still in a downtrend, don't get me wrong, but it's sort of slowed in its descent a little bit. At shorter term, you're starting to get a few of these areas that are trading sideways. 
I don't know if they're bottoming out just yet. So far, I think the downtrend remains intact. But with this kind of choppy action, you know, up, down, up, down, and now up again, as you would imagine, you're not going to see a whole lot of setups anyway. So maybe sitting on your hands might be the thing to do. I'm not going to go through too, too many of these sectors because I've kind of beat the dead horse on them lately. But a lot of sectors have recently peaked up to new highs and have reversed and come right back in. And when you dig within some of these sectors, like, for instance, if you look at the banks, look at the regional banks. Okay, you can see they've really imploded in here. Uh, depends on which regionals you're looking at, but some are, are uglier than others, as you can see. If you're looking at the semis, look within the semis. Look at the... I guess is what I'm. I guess what I'm trying to say is look at everything, okay. But if you look at the semis, the semis have kind of gone sideways. If you look at material makers within the semiconductors, you could see that they're looking a little bit more ominous, okay. Especially if you throw a bow tie moving average than the overall sector. So lately, the theme has been. And it, granted, it has improved a little bit over the last week, but lately my theme has been. When you look beneath the surface, it's a lot uglier than when you just look at what's going on on the surface. So the point I'm trying to make is make sure you dig a little deeper uh, within before getting too excited about a market, okay? Okay, wow. Lots of questions and stuff uh, stacking up. Yeah, Gary, uh, feel free to email me any questions you might have, okay? Thoughts on SWHC? That's going to be a gun maker. Well, it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place, okay? Um, it is making new highs, but it has no structure. For me to get excited about a stock, it's going to have to have some sort of structure, uh, thrust followed by a pullback. It, it can't trade like an electric cardiogram. Now, it is making new highs. So maybe if it can continue to make new highs and then pull back, it might be worthwhile. Um, I seem to remember this stock being tradable back in 2012. I noticed I've got it marked up here. But then it became pretty erratic and tough to trade. My methodology is not a be-all, end-all, do-all methodology. Uh, but I don't know what kind of methodology could trade a stock that gaps up, comes all the way back in, gaps up, comes all the way back in, Runs up, comes all the way down. Okay, well, well, Dave, what about a reversion to the beat? Well, I think you get your buttocks handed to you because it, it doesn't look like it in this chart, but if you were actually trading this, it really overshoots that reversion to the beat. And I think you'd be a hurt and pup uh, quite often, especially if you don't use stops as they suggest you uh, do uh, when you reversion to the mean trading. So it's kind of wide and loose all over the place. If it could start getting its act together and trending, then maybe it might be worthwhile. Joe says, is it the move to energies and metals, normal group rotation, and aging bull market? The answer to that is yes. These groups generally peak after overall market. Martin Pring has a book about this effect, the all-season investor. Martin Pring, smart guy. I suggest you read everything by Martin Pring. And he's probably right. I was just um, at a conference, and what was his name? Gary Anderson? Let me make sure I got the right guy. Yeah, Gary Anderson. And he wrote a book, The Janus Fact. I haven't read it yet. I'm busy reading Greg's book, and then I've got to finish some other books here before I get around to getting that. But um, his, he wrote a book called The Janus Factor, and when he was giving his speech, he talked a lot about that. You have this. You have this rush away from the momentum stocks, the go-go stocks, the high beta stocks, the high volatility stocks, the stocks that I know and I love, okay, the stocks that are in the Landry 100. And then you have this rush towards these more uh, lower beta stocks, such as the energies and utilities and more defensive areas. And he's quantified that, and that's a very fascinating research uh, very cerebral type of stuff, though. It's, it's pretty heavy. But he had some scatter plots that just were amazing that actually showed it when he changed the slides. Um, I wish there was a way to, to, to visualize this. But it looked like a bunch of dots that were all out in space and random. And all of a sudden, when you get this transition, they just they all smash together. It's kind of cool to see how this thing unfolded. And it's just fascinating research that Gary has done. Um, 
So, yeah, you're definitely on to something. Isn't this a normal rotation uh, for an aging bull market? And the answer is yes, but I think it's also a sign when you see a market running away from momentum and going to these uh, defensive areas, I think that's a very negative sign. Uh, one other point uh, about relative strength and go-go and -go stocks and all, uh, and, I'm, and I'm working to uh, show this, and I might actually include this um, in some writing that I'm doing, but if you take the Landry 100, which is mostly a high data stock index, and you, you look at it daily, and you look over the day-to-day -day price changes, and you could, I could show you how to do this personally, uh, but it, it's not that hard. But I'm just tracking these high beta stocks, and this list will get absolutely creamed right before the market tanks. And I was looking at that yesterday. This is a pretty fascinating things that happened. So if anything, uh, just by watching that momentum carefully, when you see it get creamed, you know that the overall overall market is due to get creamed shortly. I'm trying to think of when it got whacked in here. Um, it got whacked four percent a while back. I'll have to find it before next presentation. But after that, it went down four percent. That was the beginning of the end of this last uh, leg lower, and that's one thing that's kind of fascinating, is that your momentum is going to get slammed first. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And then you'll see things like a flight to these more defensive issues. Okay, so I wouldn't I wouldn't write it off as uh, a normal thing, um, although I guess the what's happening is kind of normal. But I would I'd see it as, as as much as a cautious flag as anything. That's why I had a caution flag in my site the other day. Okay. Okay, Rick's got a great question. I guess the question, general question is how inefficient stocks reached in the past. Do they always remain inefficient? Uh, webinar, very inf informative. Rick, inefficiency or efficiency, however you want to look at it, is a moving target, okay? Um, the little burrito maker that's making these great burritos uh, becomes catches on and grows and grows and grows, and then the stock goes to the moon, and then all of a sudden – uh, there's a thousand stores all over the United States or 10,000 stores all over the United States. That company matures and all of a sudden analysts start showing up saying, well, wait a minute, they're just making burritos. They're only making 10 cents per burrito. How many burritos could they sell? And, uh, Taco Bell has these new burritos that are, that are made out of, uh, burritos that are made out of Doritos. <laughs> you know, it's like, so competition arises or they start comparing to competition and, they t all this stuff tends to cancel itself out, and then that once inefficient stock becomes an efficient one. Now, if you go to my website, there's an article called The Go-Go Nobo, and that is looking to short an efficient stock because it has the potential to make an efficient move. And that was the GME that I showed you earlier. They're not splitting the freaking atom. They're selling used video games. Well, la di da I mean, come on, that brings back the old video store uh, rental model, which uh, no longer works in this day and age. So I'm not that impressed, not to confuse the issue with facts, but I'm not that impressed. And get, given the technical pattern that's there, then that stock has the potential to make an inefficient move. Read the, um, read the article, and I think it'll make a little bit more sense. But, yeah, I'm fascinated with inefficiency and efficiency, and it's like I wrote this long chapter on it. And I'm like, God, I hope this isn't boring because it's so exciting to me, but it's really, it is kind of like blah, 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 blah. But it's exciting that you're interested in it. And I, I tell you, inefficiency, it, it's, it's a great thing uh, to study. Efficiency, inefficiency, and also uh, relative strength. All these things are great things to learn about. And the nuances is just fascinating when it comes to this. NASDAQ, no higher since early March, but possible higher low. All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. No higher since early March, but possibly a higher low. Well, it's hard for me to get excited. And again, I don't, well, I don't see a higher low. No, it's a lower low. Okay, I don't get too excited about the fact that it found a little support its prior low in here. Now, if this was at, if we were at 10 year lows in the NASDAQ, that's a different story. But this is a high-level double bottom. I wouldn't get too excited about that. 
Um, but yeah, this low is lower than this one. I'm not sure what you're saying. I mean, you could draw a trend line beneath them, and it's kind of a, it has a little bit of a slope to it. Will do. Your explanation makes sense. Thank you, Rick. I wasn't trying to be a smart ass, but I never heard the term inefficient stock before. So I was just wondering what pattern sets up if it remains a viable company. I just remember back to the Facebook IPO and subsequent trading months. Oh, Rick, I, I didn't take it wrong. I, I hope you didn't take me. Uh, I, I, can, I am a bit of a smart ass, so I, I do come across uh, <laughs> a little rough at times. Uh, so hopefully you weren't thinking about uh, that. No, uh, inefficiency, uh, like I said, it's a moving target. Um, and you need to have uh, you need to have a setup. No matter what you do, it you need structure. No matter what, you, like I'm a big fan of volatility and getting the volatility right in a stock. Volatile enough, but maybe not too volatile. That Goldilocks volatility reading, but you have to have some sort of structure within the stock. Okay. AMD for a long. That's going to be a semiconductor. Uh, no, no, that's that looks that's a little bit. Uh, let me get Nicholas out just in case. But that does look a little bit like electric cardiogram, okay? And it does have a little bit of a sideways movement, okay? Now we're talking about efficiency, okay? Now maybe back here the stock made an inefficient move, and maybe it was inefficient, and then maybe back here. This nice little tread down was a nice inefficient move, but lately this stock has been fairly efficient in that it just chops around and goes sideways. Okay, so this is certainly nothing to get. I'll be in a bit of a volatile efficient stock. It's just there's no structure there, and the volume. Look at the volume on this is ridiculous. So all these traders are tending to cancel each other out. And the stock just tends to chop around. So there's no structure here that's worth trading. What's going to, what now has to happen before you get into NUSMF? NUSMF. NUSMF. I'm not sure what you're asking, Gary. Is that an acronym for something? Like a FUBAR or something? IVEX, after doubling, then correcting about 40%, it has made first higher, higher, and higher low. Looks ready for another up move. Support at 200 day. IVEX. Yeah, I mean, you know me. Draw your line. I mean, it looks like it's headed lower to me. I, I wouldn't buy it. I mean, that's too deep of a retracement. That's a, as far as I'm concerned, that's almost 100% retracement, especially since it retraced all from its breakout, okay? So, you know, come back here. This looks beautiful. You've got a base breakout, and you got your first pullback after a base breakout, okay? So that looks pretty good. But notice that if you continue the line higher to its all-time peak here, or whatever that peak is, and you come back, and then let's go back to where we were, you're all the way back, to, or for all intents and purposes, to where you broke out from. So that's 100% retracement, and that's not something that... I want to trade, okay? <laughs> Long in USMF. I don't have that stock in my database. In USMF. I don't know what's the name of the company. Maybe I can look it up, Gary. Is it a penny stock? Foreign stock? Newell for Don. <laughs> Phil is a uh... <laughs> Stop. Now Phil, you're going to be my antagonist now. <laughs> now, nobody said anything about Don's picture. Hey, Don's here. Guess what he wants to know about? Some effing stock. Uh, might have to whip out Nicholas on this one. Well, let's see. It's at 16 now. It was at 16 a month or two or three or four or five months ago. So, um, Don, once again this week, I'm going to give you a no. You have to read. You have to go in, and I need to send you a business card. And you look at the back of my business card and see what we're looking for. And we're looking for two things. 
and we're trying to avoid the third. And that is that is we're looking for a downtrend or an uptrend. And that's what we want to focus on. And to some extent a transition and trend, but that's lesson number two. You got to understand lesson number one, uptrend, downtrend, and then you want to avoid. This is a this is this is what Nicholas doesn't like. That's your sideways trend, okay? Fix or repair daily Ford. Eh, I've had okay luck with Fords, I suppose. F Tech. I've heard him as F and O rebuilt Dodge. <laughs> Fiat, fix it again, Tony. <laughs> oh, shoot. Oh, these car jokes never get old. Ah, Don, I don't see anything to get excited about on this one. Um, it's kind of all over the place. Um, if it was coming off of major, major lows, I might get excited about it bottoming out, but I would leave it alone. Uh, would you short CMG here? Well, let's see. That's at, that's at Chipotle. We just talked about burritos. Going to make me hungry. Uh, that actually looks okay. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, best looking stock so far today. I'm not really nuts about this crazy wide range bar here, but I have to say, uh, if you were kind of gutsy, uh, yeah, it looks like it's thrusted down, pulled back a little bit. I guarantee you've got a bow tie in there. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a stock that's on its way down. I'm going to stop short of giving you a high five because it's not exactly perfect. But um, who brought that up? You know what? High five because that, that's the best looking stock so far today. All right, Fred says, PBH, enter on pullback uh, as it seems to be no real overhead resistance. What do you think? All right, Fred, let's check it out. FBH. Oops. FBH. PH. PBH. PBH, my fat fingers. Okay, let's see what we got. Uh, well, it's still got PBH, is that right? You still got to get past these peaks in here. So I wouldn't get excited about this stock until it got past its prior peaks. And then it's also a little wide and loose and kind of all over the place, but it can trend at times. So wait to see if it can make it to new highs and then play pullbacks. My only problem then is if it makes it all the way to do highs, that it could be uh, priced for perfection because the market is uh, so high. Live, no, live doesn't look too good in here uh, for DSOP. Looks like a downtrend uh, to me, okay? Live back from the dead, yeah. It would have to go down and make new lows for me to get excited about it coming back from the dead to make it a Phoenix type of stock. Okay, I mean, it did have some incredible thrust and pullbacks along the way and way up, but it was just too wild and crazy, even on the way up for me. Phil wants me to hum, hum, hum. Oh, you want stock hum. That's going to be Hugh Manor, um, which is a healthcare stock. Um, you want to short it? It looks like it's in trouble, but it's kind of all over the place. It's going to have a lot of support back here. So I don't see anything that jumps out at me. VRSK for Mr. Phil. James, you're next. Um, so don't go anywhere. Yeah, that one looks like it could be a trouble, but you, you, you got your pullback, and you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You got like four weeks or a month, almost a month of pullback in here. So I would leave it alone based on that. It certainly wouldn't be in buying it. Just yet. Hey, Carol, you're uh, you're coming up. Uh, AVGO for Mr. James. AVGO. Um, no, James, this would have to break out to new highs and, and form some sort of pattern. If you're long, uh, this is a longer-term trend follower or maybe a swing trade. It's a longer-term trend follower, as I like to do. Then, by all means, stay long. Okay. All right. What does Miss Carol want to do? GDX. GDX is going to be goal-related. And I'm probably not going to like it. Yeah, these are the gold stocks. And my gut feeling with the golds, and I've been talking with quite a few of you guys about this and girls, 
is that the golds are going to come down to their old lows. Notice your beautiful little bow tie right here. But that bow tie is not off of all-time highs or even multi-year highs. It might be one-year highs. So I don't see this as a major signal. I see it as a minor signal. Uh, no pun intended. You get it? Minor signal. Back here, this was a major signal of the golds, and this is why I got so bullish on the golds, and it just didn't pan out. Uh, no pun intended. Okay. But now it looks like they want to go back in, in, in the com underlying commodity for that matter. They want to go back and challenge their old lows in here. Uh, the way I would play it is just be patient and wait. Let them go down to those old lows, and then maybe they'll form uh, another transitional pattern, and then maybe we'll go after them again. Okay. Nautilus Minerals. I don't know if I have that. Is that a U.S. stock, Nautilus Minerals? Nautilus Minerals, N-A-T. Is Nautilus spelled right? Nautilus N A U T Nautilus Incorporated. Um, that looks like it's trouble. It's a sporting goods store. Uh, it's too thin to short, but it looks like it's in trouble. You got a bow tie down. I know that you're not asking about that, but uh, no, I don't have it in my database. Sorry about that, uh, Gary. CPN on the long side for Mr. John. CPN, uh, Frenchie, you're next. Uh, maybe on a pullback. And, you know, I don't know. And utilities, utilities have been, it's just kind of getting, barely getting past these prior peaks in here. Utilities have been trending so well. I don't know. I think you may, might be able to dig within the sector and find something. Uh, I don't like the fact that it made this wide range bar here. Then it just kind of drifted up a little bit. And now it's, it's trying to peep up again. I don't know. This would have to accelerate higher and pull back before I got excited about it. I think I'd leave it alone uh, for now. And who did I say was next? Oh, Frenchie. AGR. I know this for some reason. Yeah, uh, the problem with this stock is let's just draw an arrow on it. Uh, it's headed lower. I, would, I don't think I'd rush out and short it because it's already at fairly low levels, but I do think it's in trouble. I do think it's still headed lower, and it's been a little sideways lately. I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy it, but uh, what I'm trying to say is avoid it. SLV, break its support for Miss Carol. Well, Carol is saying that silver itself is break its support, and she is correct. Uh, right you are, Miss Carol. Carol's very smart. You guys ever notice I do compliment, I tend to compliment those who are in the service more than those who aren't. You think that's so? No, it's because I got some smart people in the service. Um, yeah, it is, if you go all the way back to last July, though, which I suggest you do, you could see that silver hasn't really broken support, maybe short-term support. Um, I wouldn't rush out and short this market, okay? But let's take a look at a weekly chart here. It is kind of hovering around multi-year lows. So going back to a daily chart, maybe, just maybe, if it could continue to sort of go sideways in here, maybe your next bow tie or first thrust or whatever the case may be, other transitional pattern, might be worth a shot, okay? All right, Howard says, there seems to be a lot of round trips lately. What does this mean to you? S-E-T-Y, Yelp, Fi, D-D-D. -D -D. Um, Howard, I think, you know, I haven't read too much into that, uh, but it's a very interesting observation, and thanks for bringing it up. Um, it always happens, okay, but it just seems like the, the, the uh, velocity or the compression of it happening is a lot more compressed in more recent times than, than um, historically. So those are go-go stocks that are just getting whacked. And uh, I guess like Twitter was another one that did that, the round trip. Uh, I, would just, I would just chalk it up as a sign of the times. Remember earlier I was talking about Mr. Anderson's work, Gary Anderson's work, and uh, about how you have a uh, evacuation, so to speak, of these momentum-based stocks and a flow into the more defensive-based stocks. So I think you're on to something. I think it's just a sign of the times. 
but it's just one little piece of the puzzle. Jonathan wants to know what's a round trip. Um, Jonathan, you must not have been trading long if you never, <laughs> if you haven't experienced a round trip. Um, a round trip is where, kind of like a round trip, okay? I leave from New Orleans and then I come back to New Orleans, okay? I leave from New Orleans, I go to Australia, I come all the way back to New Orleans. That's a round trip. In a stock, it's when um, a stock goes all the way up and then comes all the way down, okay? So it goes all the way up and then goes all the way down back to where it started from, okay? And in futures terms, a round trip is, is just a, a, a buy and sell complete transaction, okay? Okay, you don't support SLV anyway. Um, yeah, you know, SLV, it's getting a little support, but if it if it starts to, um, now I'd much rather be in an inefficient silver stock than silver overall, okay? Phil wants to know about EFTC. I think that's a stock that's still in trouble. You got the, I think you got your, your I think you talked about ETC, ET. FC, um, I think it's still in trouble. You know, when in doubt, take the chart out. Okay, that looks like a thrust followed by a deep retracement, but it's not a tradable pattern based on my patterns. Okay, uh, it's too many days in the pullback. So uh, let me interview myself. Does it look like a major top still in place? Yes. Would I trade it? No. But I hear you, Phil. It's 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 got head and shoulders characteristics. I know what you're trading to. I know I know why you like it. I bet you a hundred dollars it's kissing its fifty day moving average. Maybe. Let's see. Maybe that's what he's looking at. Ah ah! I figured it out. Phil likes to trade these uh, retraces to the fifty day moving average, which is kind of cool. It's a cool pattern. Um, you know, one thing I found with the brokerages, it seems like any time I short a broker, it goes straight back up, <laughs> and any time I don't, they they implode. But it's it's almost kind of weird like that. I, I guess I'm a little gun shy from years of um, of uh, bad trades in the brokerages. Seems like for some reason they're hard to short, and I, I haven't figured that out just yet. Maybe uh, maybe they don't want to let them their stocks go down for some reason. Silver looks more like a buy. No, uh, silver needs to be um, in a trip. Yeah, I, I know the pattern, though, Phil. You're not the only one that's trading it, but it is a good pattern. So I have to give you some kudos. Uh, on that, Phil likes to trade those uh, retraces back to the 50. Um, it's it's a pretty cool pattern, I have to admit. Uh, sorry if I missed it. Do a VRNG looks like basing breakout higher? VRNG for Mr. Jonathan. Uh, no, I don't really see much there. It's uh, it's not thin, but it looks like a thin stock the way it trades. Um, it's just kind of all over the place. I would leave it alone. It would really have to do, um, you know, longer time. It's electric cardiogram. Um, if Don were asking about this, I'd say no. <laughs> so leave that one alone, Jonathan. I'm not going to pick on you. Jeff says he wants to know about a particular stock. Jeff, I'm going to give you a high five. That is the best looking stock that I could find after going through 2,000 stocks yesterday. So the question is, why am I not mentioning it? Because it's a setup for today in my trading service. So congratulations to you. Uh, Donald Sterlings. I don't know who Donald Sterling, Sterlings is. Is that the guy that just kind of sort of mouthed off a little bit, got himself in trouble? Yeah, good job, Jeff. High five. You know, that's the biggest high five, and I, I want to show that. So next week, remind me. I'll pull it up. Um, that's the best looking stock out there. Absolutely. Invex, after doubling, then correcting, about 40% higher. It's made its first higher high. Yeah, we looked at that. Uh, James wants to know about CVD. CVD. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, uh, that stock's in major trouble, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to set up, okay? So it's not set up, but oh, my goodness. Yeah, that stock uh, looks like a um, – I don't want to – how do I say <laughs> – garbage um you got a bow tie down you got a thrust down so yeah on a pullback i mean it might have a little support back here that's the only thing that would bother me a little bit but at least it made it almost there ideally if you could just get a little bit past that support in a little bit of a pullback so whoever uh bought in this range might get a false sense of confidence and when that market begins to roll over again 
they'll begin to feel the pain. Keep in mind that everything I do is logically based. It is based on the emotions of others and capitalizing on the emotions of others. Okay, and that's what you should do too. So when you look at a chart, realize there are people behind those bars, and you want to see it get past that support first, and then make a little bit of a pullback, and that'll give those people a false sense of security. And then when that happens, if you have this all the way to here, then everybody above this level here is going to be a hurt and pop when that stock begins to drop, and anyone who hasn't sold out will be more inclined to sell out. Uh, if you have time, go read the uh, Go Go Nomo strategy on my website. I talked a lot about overhead resistance in um, in that one. CCU for James, we're way over time, so we'll probably have to wrap it up here quickly. Uh, it's bottoming out, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it. You know, right now the foods are kind of going straight up. I wouldn't be bottom fishing the foods at uh, at this juncture. Okay, uh, let's see. It's on QTC QX. Yeah, I don't have those uh, stocks readily available to pull up. Uh, no, this is another stock. Here, there's your round trip. Uh, this is a an IPO which straight up and it came all the way back down. Um, but yeah, there's certainly nothing to do there. Well, look, I'm out of time. Oh, we're way over time, and um, the recordings are impossible to process once they get past an hour and a half. Or so, so I better shut it down. I, I have so much fun doing these things. I can't tell you. Um, uh, enough, or I can't express enough my gratitude that you would take time out of your busy schedule to be here. This is for me is a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully, see all you guys and girls again uh, next week. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. I'll either answer you directly, or it could be uh, fodder for uh, next week's show. Uh, <laughs> okay, Don. No. All right, everybody. Again, have a great weekend, and I guess uh, see all you, all you uh, guys and girls uh, next week. Thank you so much.